Amen. Thank you to those who have led us so well in worship. As we now draw our attention to the Word of God, please join me in a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful. We are thankful uh, that we have worshiped you, and we pray that we have done just that, um, and that thus far we have honored you, that our worship has been sincere and passionate, that it's brought you the honor and glory which you deserve. And we pray that our worship would continue as we now open up our Bibles. May your Spirit lead us, guide us to truth. May we feel both comforted and convicted. May you use this time to yet again open our eyes to how big and how good you are. And may you show us our response to how good and faithful you are to us. Use this time. May we have the ears to hear. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I visited Hazel in her room during a brief hospital stay, and as I was ready to leave the hospital room, I offered up a prayer, and and I prayed the, the sort of prayer that I often pray when I'm in a hospital room. I I prayed for God's presence to be felt in that room. I I prayed uh, for wisdom for the doctors. I I prayed that the, the medical issue would be properly diagnosed and properly treated. I I prayed for a, a full recovery and a short hospital stay. After I prayed the prayer that I've prayed countless times, I kind of stood up and prepared to walk out of the door when Hazel motioned to me. She was trying to get my attention. She, in fact, got my attention and then pointed me back to the chair. Now, she had not said much over the course of this visit, but she said very clearly um, and loudly, I am ready to go. took me by surprise when I first heard it. I I leaned in again, and she repeated it. She said, I am ready to go. She had not said much over the course of this hospital visit, but in the next few moments, Hazel described her faith, how she came to faith, how she had been trusted in Jesus all of her life, and she described her joyful desire to be in the full presence of the Lord. Hazel, a woman full of faith, was prepared to finish well. I knew a bit of her story. I knew her family well. Hazel came to faith as a young girl. She spent her life devoted to her family and to her Lord. She served her church faithfully through regular attendance and teaching a Sunday school class and volunteering at VBS. And she was an encourager to everyone around her. She served her community as well. She and her husband owned the little corner store in town where they pumped gas back when you did that for people. Right? She, she pumped gas and serviced cars and shared the love of Jesus. It was months after that brief hospital day that Hazel died and went to be with the Lord. That little church was filled with people providing testimony to her faith and how she finished well. This is our 12th week in our Stained Glass Disciple series. It it highlights lessons that modern-day disciples can learn from that original group who accepted Jesus' invitation to come follow me. We've been guided through these lessons by our very own stained glass window, which provides images that depict the life story 
of the original disciples. And we've been following the disciples in the order presented to us by our window. And in our 12th week, we come to James, the brother of John. For these last four weeks now, we've, we've been through all the images that are actually in the rows of our rose window. And we've now gone to the outer edges to catch the last four images. If your gaze is upon Jesus, uh, you can move to what is your left, say nine o'clock, and you will see three seashells depicting the life story of James, the brother of John. What, what can we, as modern day disciples, learn from the life and ministry of James? Well, let us find out. Um, before we get to the main passage of focus this morning, we're going to take a brief stop at two other stories that include James. If you would first join me in Luke 9, verse 51. I know that's not what is listed in your bulletin, so you're flipping there all by design. So now that I know you're flipping and I've got a few moments to tarry, uh, let me tell you what we are going to do moving forward in this series. We've now come to the 12th week. That is all the images. Uh, we are going to take a break from the series next week. Um, that, that's the Sunday where, where we recognize seniors. That's going to happen in our 11 o'clock service. But we're going to take a break from the series next week. And then two weeks from today, we're going to come back and finish this series mainly by looking at the image of Jesus in the center. Uh, so, so no, we've got one more sermon to come. If you're in Luke 9... Uh, verse 51. Can I hear a big loud amen? Amen. Passage reads, As the time approached for him to be taken to heaven, Jesus set out, resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem when the disciples James and John saw this they asked Lord do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them but Jesus turned and rebuked them then he and his disciples went to another village it's a passage that includes James and John. James was one of the first disciples called. We see him here with his brother, the, the Zebedee brothers. James is often referred to as the, the brother of John to distinguish him from James, the son of Alphaeus, who we discussed very early on in this series. I know some of you, I just said that, some of you go, yeah, that seemed like a lifetime ago. All right, we're approaching the end of the series. We're, we're almost there. Yeah, so, so James, the, the brother of John, to distinguish him from James, the son of Alphaeus, one of the first called. And James, the brother of John, joined his brother and Peter, as we've now seen, in an inner circle. Jesus was constantly among the crowds, was frequently uh, within a, a large group of disciples, was almost uh, every time we see him in the passages of Scripture with the twelve. But then we have these images, these scenes of Jesus with an inner circle. James was in that group. It's this inner circle of three that get to see Jesus in that moment of transfiguration. It's this inner three that gets to see Jesus raise Jairus' daughter. It's this inter, inner circle of three that get to travel with Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane. And even though James is in this inner circle, even though it seems he had this close relationship with Jesus, the, the New Testament doesn't give us much. 
We don't get much about him, but what can we as modern-day disciples learn from the life and ministry of James, known as the brother of John? My first word to you is disciples have purposed passion. This came from the passage we read moments ago. In Luke 9, 51 through 56, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. For Jesus, he knows that this means the cross. Uh, for Jesus, he knows this means his death and, and his resurrection. But he's got his eyes head, headed on the cross. He's, he's going there. He goes through a Samaritan village, and he sends some disciples to get things prepared. Yeah. But they're not welcomed. And they're not welcomed by, by a few in this Samaritan village. We're only here for a moment. We won't go into the backstory of why that is. But they're not welcomed. So then James and John come to Jesus. And they ask, Lord... You want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them. I, I love the f brief nature of this passage. They're going. They're not welcomed. James and John want to call down fire, and then we're just told Jesus rebuked them. And they went to the next place. Numerous occasions as we read through the Gospels, Jesus spoke of a wholehearted devotion. He, he pointed his disciples to a passionate pursuit of him. And we see this in a number of passages. In Luke 9, 23, he says, If you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. The wholehearted devotion. I would call that a, a, a passionate pursuit of, of Jesus. In, in Luke 9, 62, Jesus says, whoever puts their hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Again, a, a passionate pursuit, a, a wholehearted devotion. But here we see in this little story, that we read moments ago? Passion, yes. But a purposed passion. Jesus calls his disciples to pursue him. And he calls them to a life of persuading others to do the same. Disciples have passion, but it's a purposed passion. When that passion is, in this case, used to request fire from heaven to consume an enemy, that type of passion is met with a rebuke. We're going somewhere. Disciples have a purposed passion. And in another passage, we see disciples are servants, not masters. For another brief moment, join me in Mark chapter 10, verse 35. Mark chapter 10, verse 35. I don't have to ask for an amen. I hear you flipping. I'll know when you're there. I don't have to ask. I'm, I'm going to get them anyway, which I appreciate that. Uh, Mark 10, 35. And I'm wanting you to look at these two passages before we get to our focus, but because I, I really want something to stay with you. We'll see this in a moment. Mark 10, 35, the passage reads, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, listen to this request, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. <laughs> what do you want me to do for you? 
Jesus asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory. Verse 38, you don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. And Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism. I am baptized with, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. The passage goes on. When when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. And Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be the first must be a slave of all. For the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Disciples are servants, not masters. In this passage, James and John approach Jesus. So we want you to do whatever we ask. I'm glad we can laugh at that here. Not a great conversation starter when you're discussing something with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In this church setting, we can read it and we can chuckle and we can see it as foolishness. But I think we've been there. I think we've voiced things just like that in our own prayer life. They go on to ask for seats of honor and glory, and Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Again, we've been there. We've made a lot of requests of God, and we we don't really know what we're asking. Jesus says, can you really drink from the cup that I'm about to drink from? Can can you truly handle being baptized with with what I'm about to be baptized with? And they said, oh, we can. Jesus ends this conversation speaking to the whole group. He says, whoever wants to be first... It's got to be last. Whoever wants to be first it needs to be a servant, a slave to everyone. Well, and we're not in this for positions of honor here on earth. We're, we're, we're here to, to serve. Jesus calls us to serve him and to serve others. Uh, disciples are servants, not masters. That brings me to the point I really want to drive home this morning. Disciples are faithful unto death. We just read two brief passages. Two passages in which James plays a prominent role. Two passages where, where, where James and his brother are m- making requests. Two passages in which James actually approaches Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and through his question exposes a bit of his heart. And in both passages, James is rebuked. 
first passage we've read, that's exactly what it says. You know, Jesus rebuked him. Our, our second passage doesn't say that Jesus rebuked him, but from the response, we actually get to read the response. It was a rebuke. Two passages in which James plays a prominent role and two passages in which he is rebuked. But even with that, imagine that being your record. <laughs> you know, you're going to make it in the Bible and that's how you get in. Two rebuke passages. But, but it's the final James passage that speaks the loudest. For those with the ears to hear, it's his final scene that shouts from the rooftops. If you'd now join me in this short passage, Acts chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Acts 12, 1 and 2. And the passage reads, just two short verses. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. That's it. Through this series, we have referenced um, the death of Disciples, much of that information coming from historical rest records and, and church history, we get James's martyrdom told to us in really just one short verse. Now, if we were just reading the book of Acts... You get to Acts chapter 12 and, and, and you see this reference to James's martyrdom and you might be fooled into thinking that, that here's his death which surely must have come from a life that was just purely onward and upward. But we just read two passages of James being corrected, of, of James being rebuked, of, of, of two passages where, where James exposed a little bit of his heart. And with that heart exposed, Jesus molded and shaped him a bit. Which for me, that makes Acts 12, 1 and 2, all the more powerful. Two passages of rebuke followed by a brief description of James being faithful all the way to the grave. His brother John, as we discussed weeks ago, grew old. It was the only of the original disciples who avoided martyrdom. James, the very first of the original group to give his life for the cause of the gospel. 
You read it. Two passages of rebuke. Faithful unto death. And it should teach us a valuable lesson. Rebuke doesn't lead to disqualification. Rebuke it doesn't lead us to being kicked off the team. Rebuke doesn't lead to Jesus booting these guys out of the group. No, we learned this lesson that with rebuke should come repentance and a course correction which then leads to spiritual maturity. Rebuke, not disqualification, but rebuke with repentance and a course correction leads to spiritual maturity. Hebrews chapter 12, this will be on the screen for you, begins this way. Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We are called to perseverance. The Apostle Paul put it this way in 2 Timothy 4, 7. At the end of his life, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. We are called to finish well. Two calls here in these two passages. A call to perseverance and a call to finish well. For me, this is a powerful message demonstrated in the life of James, the brother of John. It's a powerful message to modern day disciples, both young and old. I'll let you decide which camp you fall in, right? Completely up to you. But I think this is a powerful message for disciples, young and old. To the young, you need to be reminded the race is long. It's long. So, so if you have failed, if you have stumbled, it's not over. You've not been called out. You've not been disqualified. The race is long. Stand up. Continue to run. Not in your own power, but in the power that the Lord gives you. Stand up and keep running and finish well. To the old. Your finish line is approaching. But the same call. Keep running. Sprint to the finish. Don't slow down. The finish line is in sight. Keep running. Sprint to the finish. Provide an example to the church of what it looks like to finish well. Finish well. As disciples, we, we are not called to faithfulness for a moment. 
We are not called to faithfulness for a season. Well, we're called to faithfulness unto death. And on the way, it's a life filled with repentance and course corrections. But we're called to finish well. The stained glass window of the First Baptist Church of Sulphur Springs depicts James with seashells in his short life as a Jesus follower. He spent times on the open sea taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. He became the first disciple martyred, beheaded by King Herod at what we estimate to be around A.D. 44. Actually recorded in our gospels. Church tradition expands the story a bit we have a record of James preaching the gospel unto his death. We, we have records of James actually preaching the gospel to his jailer, leading his jailer to faith in Christ. And we even have records of the jailer being beheaded shoulder to shoulder with James who brought him to faith. As you gather in this sanctuary week after week, may you gaze upon our window. May your eyes fall upon James's seashells and be reminded of your call to be faithful to the very end. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. Um, for your grace towards us, your grace demonstrated in both your call to follow you and also your rebuke when we've gone astray. May we hear your call and may we follow you no matter what. Give us strength. Give us courage. Give us perseverance. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.